What's going on, engineers? This video is on the super awesome, blazing fast, fully in memory database that we call Redis. Part of the reason why I wanted to make this video is because I think Redis is underused in that it has a lot more functionality than people realize, and, and that includes myself. I've been using Redis now for probably four years, and it was only up until about three months ago I used any other feature besides just key value store because all I was using it for was caching and maintaining sessions for my web application. And now that I'm working on a globally distributed messaging platform, which Redis is a core piece of technology, I have never really used it to this extent before. So I want to explore two chunks of capabilities. The first chunk is the standard just getting and setting strings, hashes, and lists. And then the other one is working with the publish and subscribe mechanism. So let's jump in and have a look at what this thing can do. So first to get Redis, if you're on Linux or Mac, just head over to redis.io and click on the download button where you can download the latest Redis, which as of this video is 5.0. If you're on Windows, there is an older version of Redis you can get that will install directly to Windows, but otherwise you'll probably be best served getting the Docker image and just using that. Now, assuming you have Redis installed and running, open a terminal and simply type redis-cli and hit enter. If you see 127.0.0.1.6379, then you're good to go. The reason I have two other terminals open is we're going to need those for the subscribing and the publishing portion, but just for the manipulation of the strings and hashes and lists, we're just going to use this first terminal. So at its core, Redis is a key value store. However, what those values can be could be strings, they could be hashes, or they could be lists. So Redis supports a number of different data structures for the data that you want to store. So the simplest command that you could do is just to set a value to a key. So I could write set name Brian and hit enter and it says OK. If I want to retrieve the value of that key, I just do get name, hit enter, and it returns Brian. I can view all the keys that I'm currently storing by doing keys, and then a star. I want to hit enter, it gives me all the keys, so it says number one is name. And of course if I want to delete a key, I just do del, then the key name, call it name, hit enter, and it's gone. I can then verify it's gone by doing get name, it says nil, keys star, empty list. Keep in mind that all these operations, they happen really, really fast, and that's because Redis is 100% in memory. All of your data is in memory. It, there is an option where Redis will persist the data from memory to disk, so it can survive things like reboots and shutdowns and whatnot. But as you're working with it, it's always in memory. So the last thing about setting key values is that you can specify whether a key should expire at some point. So just like before, I'll put my name back in. So set name Brian, and then I'll do EX, and then 10. So what that means is set the value Brian to the key name, and then expire that key after 10 seconds. So what I'll do is I'll insert this key, and then now a timer is counting down. I'm going to do get name and we'll see that Brian is still there. However, now that more than 10 seconds has gone by, if I do get name, I instead get nil, because that key has expired and the data is now gone. A good use case for expiring keys would be things like sessions that you only want active for, say, a day, or cached information that you want to refresh every so often. So maybe you cache something for an hour, so you insert it with a 3600 expiration. One of the patterns in your application would be your application would say, does this key exist? If it does exist, it would just pull that cache value and display that to the user. If the key does not exist, it would gather up all the data, store it in Redis, and then send it to the user. And the reason you want to do this is because retrieval from Redis, in most cases, is going to be significantly faster than retrieval from like a relational database, like MySQL, Postgres, or SQL Server. Next thing I'll look at is hashes. Hashes are a lot like objects or structs or dictionaries in other languages. So maybe you'd have a struct that's called like person, and in the person struct there'd be an integer age and a string name. So to represent that in Redis, you would do hset, and then it'd be the name, so we'll call it person, and then the field would be name, and then the value would be whatever, you know, so Brian. 
So now we'll set age. Age set, person, age, 33, enter. So now that I've set that key person, I have two options for retrieval. The first option is to retrieve it by key and field. So if I want to get the name, I would do age get person name, and it would return Brian. If I wanted to just get the full hash, I would do h get all person and hit enter, and it would give me key value, key value, or rather field value, field value. The key in this case would be person. If you want to delete a specific key from a field, you would do h del, the key should be person, and it will just delete the age. You can see now if we do get all that the age is gone. If you want to delete the entire hash, it's the exact same as deleting a string. You just do del, the name of the key. And now it's gone. Now we can verify that by looking. It says empty list or set. So we've looked at now keys to strings, looked at keys to hashes, and the last thing is going to be keys to lists. So there's a whole bunch of commands for manipulating lists and Redis. We're going to look at six commands. L push and R push, L pop and R pop, L index, and L range. And just a brief summary as to what all those do, L push pushes elements onto the left side of the list, R push pushes elements onto the right side of the list, L pop pops one item off the left side of the list, R pop pops one item off the right side of the list, L index gets you a value at a given index, and then L range gets you values at a list of indexes. And just to clarify terminology, when I say left and right, I also mean beginning and end. It's the same thing. So let's manipulate some lists. So we'll start by just adding a, we'll just say a, a three. So we'll make a list of numbers. So we'll do L push nums, and then we'll just put like a, we'll do a five. What this will let us do is it'll let us add items at the beginning and the end, you know, the left and the right. So we can check out the full list of numbers by doing L range nums start at zero, stop at negative one. And this is a fancy way of saying, give me everything. And as you can see, it's just a five. So let's make this list three, four, five. So what we'll do is we'll use L push again. So L push nums. And you can specify more than one value. Now, when you specify more than one value, they are pushed onto the beginning in order. So if I want it to be three, four, five, I'm going to have to do four and then three. That way it pushes four on first and then three in front of that. So I'll hit enter. We'll do our L range. And we see now it's three, four, five. So now if we want to make that list three, four, five, six, seven, we would now use R push. And our push works the same way. Our push nums. And then you can specify multiple values, and they're going to be pushed onto the end or the right side in order. So in this case, I would do six and then seven. I would hit enter. Then we can check the value of nums. And we now have three, four, five, six, seven. So to get a specific value, we do L index nums, then specify the index. So we'll do three. Now note here that even though Redis has it as one, two, three, four, five, the index is actually, you know, standard indexing, zero, one, two, three, four. So that's why we got six instead of five. And then the last, we'll just start popping values off either side of the list. So just a reminder, our list currently contains three, four, five, six, seven. So if I want to pop the three off the beginning, I would do L pop nums. You see it gives me three. If I run it a second time, it gives me four. It just keeps popping items off the beginning and then removing them from the list. So now that we've popped off three and four, we can look at the list again, and we'll see all that we're left with is five, six, and seven. So now we'll do the same, but on the right side. So instead of L pop, we'll do R pop nums, and then this will give us the seven, and then run it again, it'll give us the six. At this point, there's only one element in the list, so L pop and R pop, they're going to do the same thing. So we'll pop the last number off, got a five. If you try to pop again, it just it's just nil because the list is empty. This is also how you could use Redis as a message queue, whereby the thing putting messages in would use R push, and then the thing consuming messages would use L pop. You could also use those in reverse as well.
So the last thing we're looking at is going to be pub sub stuff, publish and subscribe. So for this, we're going to need to be logged into Redis on all three terminals. So pub sub is a pattern where publishers publish information to subscribers who want the data and the publishers don't care who's subscribed at the time that they publish. And then subscribers can subscribe to data that they want and they don't care who's publishing the data. So in this way, the publish and subscribe step are sort of separate. So the first thing is subscriptions. Now subscribers can subscribe to any channels they want from their client. So for instance, terminal two, I'm going to subscribe to a channel called room one, for instance. So subscribe room one. For the terminal three, I'm going to subscribe to room two. So now any messages published to room 1 will go to terminal 2, and any messages published to room 2 will go to terminal 3. And we can test this. So the publish step is simply writing publish, and then specifying the channel. So I'll do room 1, and then specifying the message. So hello room 1, for instance. And when I hit enter, you can see that it pushes that message to terminal 2. I can also send the same message to room 2 by changing room 1 to room 2 then pressing enter. And now it's sent it to terminal three. So now I've started everything over because I want to subscribe to different rooms now. So instead of subscribing to room one and room two, I'm going to subscribe to multiple rooms per terminal. So terminal two is going to subscribe to room one and room two. Terminal three is going to subscribe to room two and room three. So what we've done now is room one only goes to terminal two, room two goes to both, and room three only goes to terminal three. So let's come back to our publisher terminal and we'll test this out. So we'll do publish room one, hello room one. You can see it just goes to terminal two. Now when I publish to room two and hit enter, you can see it went to both this time. And when I publish to room three, You can see it just went to that third terminal. Now remember earlier I said I was working on a globally distributed messaging platform? Well, using the pub sub pattern and using Redis is core to that operation. Because managing rooms and clients and publishing messages, that's, that's pretty difficult business. And Redis accomplishes this w without a problem. So it's, it's an ideal fit for, for the use case that I have. The last thing I want to talk about is Redis cluster. And one thing that makes Redis really powerful is the ability to scale Redis out horizontally. As you go to scale out Redis, what you do is you add additional master nodes into the cluster. And for every master node that you add, you are basically spreading out where the keys are. So if you have 10 master nodes, then each node is holding roughly 10% of the keys. The good thing about Redis cluster is you can access any of those 10 nodes. You don't necessarily have to access the one that has the key you're looking for. When you request a key, if it happens to be on that node, that node will simply serve you the key. If it happens to be on another node, that node will know which one it's on, and it'll tell you which one, and it'll forward the request over to there. This, this forwarding, as I, I called it, will happen by way of whichever Redis client you're using. In addition to master nodes, you can also add slave nodes. And what those do is those replicate the data of a master node. So you could have, say, 12 Redis nodes, four of which are masters, and then each one has two slaves. In this way, you effectively have three copies of your data, which gives you a higher degree of durability and reliability for your system. As well, if one of the master nodes goes down, a slave node is automatically promoted to master and then it just picks up where it left off. And then of course you can add new nodes or get rid of nodes whenever you want, you know, as your capacity increases or decreases. However, from your application standpoint, you're simply making a request to any of the nodes and you don't really care which one because it's gonna get you to the data that you need. And that's true whether you have one Redis node or 10,000. Now one thing I didn't do in this video is I didn't make it about any one language. You know, there's, there's Redis clients for all languages. You can get it for Python, you can get it for JavaScript, you can get it for C, C++, Java, C Sharp. There's, there's tons of Redis clients out there and you can pick the ones you like the best. 
but you're going to see that all the Redis clients work roughly the same way. You're going to create a new Redis instance, and then you're probably going to call like redis.set or redis.hset or redis.lpush. And then the arguments that you provide are going to be the same arguments that are provided, you know, here in the demonstration. So if you understood what I did here in the terminal, then it's going to be very easy to work with it in your language of choice as well. And that's it for the video. Redis is really powerful and excellent software, and I, I hope I was able to show you some of the basics of it, some of the core competencies, some of the core capabilities, and then also some of the lesser used stuff like PubSub. As always, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments down below or come chat with me on Discord. Otherwise, I will see you on the next video.